Hey folks, David Stewart here. It's time for some more philosophy and logic. Today it's going to be survivorship bias. I talked about this a little bit on a past live stream, but I wanted to make it its own little video so we could interact with those ideas all on their own. Survivorship bias is what happens whenever you have a gate that allows some information through but hides some other set of information and makes it invisible. Um, this exists in lots of different fields of research, lots of different fields of data exist with stocks, it exists in medicine in particular, and there's survivorship bias everywhere. And one of the things about survivorship bias is because it hides some set of data, it's often difficult to detect. The classic example that's used to explain this is that of Abraham Wald, a statistician who was employed by the US government to tackle wartime problems back during World War II. And the classic example is the distribution of flak damage on bombers when they returned from their bombing missions. Um, so what they did is they looked at where all the bullet holes were in the bombers after they returned from their bombing missions, you know, where they, where they'd been shot on the wing or shot in the fuselage. And then they looked at the distribution of all those shots and of course, the conventional wisdom is to look at the most concentrated areas of where they were shot and say, well, we need to reinforce those areas with some additional armor to make the bombers more robust. And Wald said, no, it's actually the opposite. Wherever you don't see holes, that's where the plane is shot and crashes. Where you do see holes, that's where the plane can be shot and thus survive. So if you're going to reinforce the plane, you put the armor in the places where there are no bullet holes. Uh, that's because it's hiding part of the data. There was a survivorship bias there. And the part of the data which was relevant, which is where can the plane uh, get shot and then crash, is missing because crashed planes are invisible. These sorts of problems exist in lots of different areas in life. A really classic example is in the area of crime prevention. Uh, whenever you're trying to figure out whether some law intended to prevent crime is actually effective in doing so, you have to consider that crimes which don't happen are invisible. There's a survivorship bias called either a crime happens or it doesn't happen. So if a law is actually effective in stopping a crime from ever happening, it just disappears. And the only way to maybe think that it's there is to compare different statistics across years. But then it's very difficult to isolate the effect of a law. And this is true whether it's like, you know, um, sex offender registries that are there to alert people, whether there's a sex offender in the neighborhood or something like that, or it's laws intended to prevent people from um, having access to things like explosives, which they could use uh, to harm other people. It's difficult to see data that doesn't exist. Uh, likewise, you can have this in medicine. If you have a drug trial and people quit the drug trial due to the side effects, they don't necessarily end up in the final data set comparing you know, the placebo to the actual drug. Uh, they just get eliminated from the data set. And some drugs have actually gone all the way into the market only to be recalled later once uh, there's epidemiological evidence on their side effects. Uh, the most recent example that comes to mind for me is Darvacet, which was a, a pain relief drug um, that I think was pulled off the shelves back in the 2000s uh, because it turns out it caused like heart palpitations and things. These are things that might have showed up in a drug trial if all of the data had been included and if you weren't eliminating um, some people from that data set. Um, so it's a problem in medicine, it's a problem with crime. It can even be a problem when we're just looking at basic things like education. Whenever you have um, standardized tests, standardized tests, if they're used as a gate, um, can create a survivorship bias. So let's say in order to get into medical school, you have to have a certain GRE score, I don't know, 1400, which might approximate to like an IQ of 120 or something like that. So if you have uh, you know, your 1400 GRE score, you can get into medical school. If you don't have a 1400 GRE score, you can't get into medical school. Well, that creates a little bit of a survivorship bias. You don't really know if the people who didn't get a certain GRE score um, would actually be able to be competent doctors because you've essentially eliminated them. And so what you end up with is this kind of a feedback loop. You end up with the circular reasoning, um, which happens in lots of different places where you're like, well, doctors need to have, uh, uh, you know, they need to have an IQ of this. Well, 
in order to be doctors, because all doctors have an IQ of this, it becomes this circular thing. And that's because you've eliminated the people who had either lower IQs or didn't score well on this test and things like that. And you don't actually know how they would have ended up as physicians or how they would have been uh, in the professional field. Not saying they would have been just as good, but you don't know because there's a survivorship bias. It's eliminated some portion of the data. And you see this with the military. Um, there's various, um, you know, jobs that you can have in the military like fighter jet pilot that before you can actually you know get into the program to be a fighter pilot you have to score a certain amount on tests uh, which produces a little bit of a survivorship bias um, we see this in lots of different places with data anytime that you have data that's missing or excluded that's something that um, creates survivorship bias one of the things that happens in education um, while we're thinking about standardized tests if you're comparing the test outcomes of American school kids against other countries, you're actually comparing a really complete data set in the United States to um, a biased data set in the foreign country in most cases. Um, so just as an example, let's say um, you're, you're going to collect all of your standardized testing data for math. Math tends to you know, cross cultures pretty well. Um, and you find, oh, American students are really far behind, uh, say, Japanese students in math. What's missing, though, is that the Japanese students, they don't test those who are, say, have Down syndrome. Uh, we in the United States are legally required to test and record the data for, for kids who have intellectual disabilities. Everybody gets tested regardless of their intellectual capacity and gets included in the data set. And the whole idea there is that every kid matters whether he has an intellectual disability or doesn't have an intellectual disability. You need to know where they're at um, versus other countries where they don't test those people. And in fact, there's additional layers of survivorship bias that are added in, including that based on how you score in certain tests, you may be shuffled off into a trade school route and don't end up for the final set of testing that you do with high schoolers. Um, so one of the ways that you can detect this is if scores are fairly fairly close and then they diverge once you get into secondary school, chances are there's some sort of survivorship bias happening there where you are missing part of the data uh, for the other country. So sometimes there's an unrealistically grim picture of um, educational test scores in this country due to survivorship bias in other countries and the fact that you're comparing the two uh, regardless of the bias. And it requires a little bit more finagling with the data for you to get a more accurate picture of what's going on. So anyway, that's my some of my thoughts on survivorship bias. One of the things that's important to know about it is that it's difficult to detect. I'll give you one last example for how survivorship bias can present itself. And this has to do with the way that people look at other people and try to emulate the acts of other people in order to achieve success. And so one of the things that you might do is you might look at a character like Steve Jobs and look at all the things he did and, and conclude that the things he did created his success. Or you come up with a list of things that he did and they're like, these things created his success. Or you see things like the, the such and such habits of highly effective people. Now what's missing from the data set is the people who were exactly like Steve Jobs and dropped out of school like him or did things very, very similar to him and never achieved success. You are missing the people who are unsuccessful. So if you're going to think of like what, what sort of personality things, what sort of choices create success in a person, you have to also look at the data that includes those who are unsuccessful. You have to look at the people who did not survive as well as the people who did survive. Otherwise, you are looking at an incomplete data set. If you were to look at, I don't know, a band like Motley Crue, and you were to say, okay, Motley Crue did these things, played this style of music at this time, and that's why they were successful. So if we just do what they did, we'll be successful. What you're missing is there was a bunch of bands playing in the same places as Motley Crue, same kind of music, same level of talent, if not better, playing the same amount of gigs. They just didn't achieve success. Motley Crue's success might have been random, and you won't know that unless you're able to actually compare the failures and the successes. The problem is you don't know who failed because they failed. They didn't put out the albums. They didn't go in tour. They didn't achieve any fame. They just kind of disappeared into obscurity. So how are you going to go find that data and see if they did the same things as Motley Crue and didn't achieve success? Now, the reason I know that there are bands who did the same thing is I actually know the people who didn't achieve the same level of success that were playing at the same time in the same places and just never really um, made it big. You know, they became like Anvil rather than like Metallica. So 
Anyway, thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and let me know what you think about all this fun stuff down below and the presence of survivorship bias in affecting our thoughts um, and affecting our uh, ability to make good decisions in the world that is. Um, and all my books are available for sale if you want to buy them. They're not philosophy or logic books. They're fiction books, but uh, I appreciate it anyway. Newest one, which isn't even in stores. You can't even pre-order it. It's called Voices of the Void. You can get it if you're on my mailing list at dvspress.com slash list. Uh, if you get on my mailing list, you'll get a free copy of that. It's another two-hour read. Uh, Sci-fi horror, quite gory. So if that's not your thing, that's okay too. So I'll see you guys next time.